الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, We meet you today in our weekly lecture talking about relief and development or humanitarian response is a philosophical ideology field program and societal development Say it again, humanitarian response, which we used to call it emergency response or relief response, is three, has three principles, philosophical ideology, field operational program, and societal development. From the day one of any conflict, we should think about doing development, development program or project in the society. From day one of the emergency, we think to plan and do societal development. Next, please. This when we look at the pyramid, the ideology of philosophy, or the philosophy of the ideology, the oppression and fear the program, and the societal development. Next one, please. Now we we'll talk about the idea and the philosophy of any humanitarian response. We we'll call it relief response. We we'll call it emergency response. Basic fundamental principle of it is the intention. Your intention of doing such a response. This is the cornerstone of progressing towards the development. Intention means responsibility. When you stand to try to have effective humanitarian response, you must feel that you are responsible for the people that you are talking about them. Then, once you have these two principles in your heart, God will choose you to carry on this process. As God has chosen his prophets and messengers. Stifa. So intention, responsibility, and selectivity. By whom? By God, not only by the organization. Second layer is you have to believe strongly and deeply in the process of a material response that you are going to try to help those people. A material response has to have values. You have to respect the values of humanitarian response. Every work that we have must have certain principles and values. And you know that humanitarian response also is a mission that must be accomplished by yourself. Whether you are a male or a female, old or young, from the south or from the north or from the east, educated or not educated, because the balance here is the intention and being responsible. Belief, values, and mission. Then, humanitarian response is an ownership. Who is the owner of our fund, of our operation, of our program? Is the poor and the needy is the refugee and the displaced, not even the donor. Ownership here must be known clearly for every one of us working in this field to give it to whom? To the poor, the vulnerable, the displaced, and the refugees. Accountability to everyone. First, accountability to God, community, governments, donors, organizations, and to the refugees as well as the displaced people. We are accountable to the people that we are claiming that we are serving them, to the people that we are claiming that we are actually standing for the rights and defending the rights and advocating for them. Ownership, accountability, and message. It's a message that you keep delivering day and night 
to save, to save and guard and give help to such people. If it's an ownership, accountability and message. Also it's politics because humanitarian response is governed by policies and procedures governed by the local politics, the international politics, governed by all these, actually, parameters that we need to follow. It's also governed by security, how we can work with the security and do not upset them, how we can become transparent, especially in the areas where there's armed conflicts. The security and the intelligence, they go back to back or hand in hand. That's why I advise the startup amateur organizations, volunteers, don't try to jump high in an area of a conflict, armed conflict, without understanding the knowledge and without understanding the mechanics of the presence of security and the intelligence in such area. Very important to know how to deal with those intelligence for there, which you don't know them, and security is there, so you have to respect the law of the land. Point number five is to keep informing people what you are doing. As I said, transparency. Keep opening the doors. Don't hide information, because the information we have from the field is owned by the public, shared by everyone in the, uh, in, 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 in the area. Informing others. Directing your program, changing your direction, and focusing on the delivery. So informing others, directing the fund to the most needed area, and focusing in the area that we or you are able to deliver successfully your humanitarian response. Humanitarian response as a philosophical ideology is awareness. Making people aware of the depth and the enormity of the problem itself. Making them aware. Don't keep the information to yourself. Publicize it. Advocate it. Spread it. Then it is the recognition of the effort of the local communities, of any worker, of any organizations. And also it's a culture. Humanitarian response has a culture that we need to understand the depth of such a culture. A part of this culture it is values, huh? which you talk about it, the values which to respect the dignity of the poor and vulnerable refugees and displaced people, children, women, and elderly, respecting their local culture as well. Don't impose your own culture on them. Respect the local culture even if they are from a different religion. And don't impose, don't impose, and listen to this again, don't impose your ideology and your religion on them and don't compel them and don't force them to accept your religion and ideology because they are vulnerable and weak and marginalized. It's advocacy as well. You have to stand up and fight for the rights. You have to stand up advocacy and rights and duties. Your right, their rights. Your duties, their duties. If you are a humanitarian response candidate or working on this, you have to advocate for their rights. For their rights. The rights for the access of human decent life. And your duties. And their duties as well. So it's advocacy, rights, and duties. Moving up to the top of the other semana. We don't want somebody who is actually engaged in this humanitarian response who is ill-mannered who is arrogant, who is big-headed. No matter who is he or she or where they came from or how rich they are or how knowledgeable they are, if they are ill-mannered, Ill we don't want them. Out. 
out. We don't want the ill-mannered people. It's principles. Humanitarian response has principles and fundamental principles. And we have to follow. And we have to follow. There is an international uh, humanitarian law. There is local law. There is all these principles which actually govern the delivery of the humanitarian response. Okay, and we have to show people what's our principles. Does it match the global, the international, and the agreed one, or is something that we are making it for ourselves? The laws. You have to respect the local law. In certain areas and certain countries, okay, what we see, we see in Africa, there's no prime minister in an area, there's no minister, but there's a sheikh or tribal leader or a sultan, whom, when you look at him, you find, oh, who is this little miserable old man, not very well dressed? and does not wear shoes and sitting. So you ignore him. You bypass him. He makes the local law. If you don't respect him, okay, you get nowhere with your program, especially in a conflict zone or in a disaster born area. So the local law is very important. It's satisfaction, pleasing and giving. First of all, you have to be satisfied when you deliver the humanitarian assistance, and this is not enough, you have to satisfy and please those poor, vulnerable refugees and displaced people. If they are not satisfied with you, huh, you cannot be satisfied by yourself. So to be satisfied that you deliver and to make them happy. Because they are the witness for you or the witness against you. And continuous giving. The giving is not money. Giving of dreams, giving of vision, giving of knowledge, giving of time, giving of effort, giving of sacrifice, and all these givings. Not, giving is not only money. It's beyond the money itself. Moving up the ladder is when you do all these things, or you realize that this is some of the parameters of your performance, especially uh, the, of the philosophical idea based on the intention and the responsibility, you continuous doing this effort, sacrifices, so the success will come at the end of the day. So from the intention to the success, it's a control of the individual's desire and behavior and the knowledge of the surrounding. So this is the philosophy of the idea of humanitarian response. Can we talk about the second slide, which is the program? We said it is a philosophical ideology, the second part, field program. Operational field program. It starts how we start humanitarian response. Scream, or I would cry. Once you hear a scream or an outcry, you hasten, you run, you jump, you fly to help such a young boy or a woman or an elderly. So outcry, hasten, then save. Just be there. Hold by the hand. This is the first step. The speed of response to the outcry of the refugees and the displaced people. Once you save them, you start to make your response to help and rescue. You run, I'm just translating from the Arabic into English, respond there and help them physically. Even be there with them if you, if you do not have the means to help them. But being with them at the time of disaster and the time when they scream and cry and call for help, this is itself a kind of help to them. Being with them at the right time, at the right place, when they want you to rescue them. Once you rescue them, they will start to become, feel safe. Safety. 
at a peace of mind, having a peace of mind, then here you start to treat them psychologically, morally, physically, bringing some food to them, some water, talking about them to others in different parts of the world by sending messages, okay, by sending images, okay, so you can hear the stories once they have peace of mind and they give you the components of what you want to deliver to humanity globally about their disasters. Once they are calm, okay, they trust you. They start, you see, the process of trust is started after being with them. You don't jump from a parachute from nowhere and say that people don't trust me. No, you have to go through this. One, two, three, run to them, save, response, uh, respond to them, help, rescue, and giving them the treatment. And then after they become, when they come calm and they are next to them, you, they start to trust you. Trust is a process. It's not a, just a message. It's not a name. It's not a, 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 a talk. Trust building is a process. Once they trust you here on this level, they will interact with you. You'll engage with you. You'll come out of the psychological shock. And they tell you the full story. And uh, phase number five in this program, look at humanitarian response as a phase. As a phase. Huh? Alternative phase in the process. One more acquaintance will be built between you and the displaced people. You have to become acquainted with you because you are building a program. Because you want to go from the outcry to development of society. And I'm said, as I said earlier on, humanitarian response is the first step of development. A development could go hand in hand when we start the humanitarian response. So once they become acquainted with you, they will be aligned. You build the alignment with them. They will let you to discover their resources. They are very wealthy in resources. You find amongst them teachers, mechanics, professors, doctors, politicians, uh, artists, farmers, businessmen, businesswomen, and so and so and so. Unless and until they are acquainted and become aligned to you, you will not, you will not, you will not discover huh, their human resources or the wealth of knowledge that they are having. And this is where we want to discover it here because we want to make them a part of the humanitarian response. We want to make them a part of the humanitarian response, but when they trust us, when they become acquainted and aligned with us, and to give us all these wealth of information. And you have seen the quality of people actually coming from Yemen, from uh, Bosnia at that time, from Iraq, the level of education they are having, from some African countries as well, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, they are not, uh, uh, they are not uh, disabled people. Yeah, when I said disabled, mean it's not mental disabled, it's not physical disabled. It is the disability here is the lack of knowledge. Those people are professional, having a lot of knowledge, are educated as we are. Once you have this here, you start to have your own vision. And your vision comes from your belief, as well as the wealth of knowledge that you have gained from them. Once you have the vision, you plan your program. Once you have the vision, you plan your program. Once you have the vision, you plan your program. When you plan your program, 
you start the process of networking. Who is working in the area? Who is working in different areas? What resources are available? You keep networking. To build what? To build partnership. No. For sure that no one organization will be able to deliver a successful humanitarian response alone. They must build partnership with the displaced people, with the local community, with the local government, with other international agencies are working in the field, with other UN and other agencies as well. So networking, partnership, then you can build a coalition. Why you build a coalition? To have a more successful, economical, faster, effective humanitarian response. Networking, partnership and coalition save money, save time, have more impact and actually uh, let us to deliver our program in a record time. Also in the program education, training and application from the very beginning, you have to start the process of education, training and rehabilitate the local community. The local community, the displaced people, the refugees, from day one, and this is a part, very important component of humanitarian response. Educating them, the simple education, which should not be equivalent to the state education. Sometimes the state education, you take the child from kindergarten to university, but here we have to have phases of education to enable the teenagers and enable the youngsters to have professions, to have training programs, and the, and the elder and, and the, the men and the women to take them to, to take them to rehabilitation and training program as well, to change them, take them from the state of shock into the state of ability, becoming, becoming able to be productive individuals in the camp, in the displacement area. From the very beginning, this should be a part of the relief. This will lead into enabling them to be more constructive and develop their area. They should be enabled. They should be empowered, actually, to be constructive and construct the locality, the community, and to, de to develop the developmental program. Yeah. So from the outcry to development, don't wait in an, any protracted area, any long-term crisis, three years, five years, six years, seven years of conflict, and say, I'm not going to do anything, Unless and until there's a ceasefire, this is wrong. Wrong, out of date ideology. Wrong and out of date waste of money. And look at what happened in Somalia over the last 25 years. Tens of billions of dollars were spent on relief response and nobody was thinking of enablement of the local community inside Somalia or in the neighboring countries. Same is happening in Syria nowadays. When you look at this, we should start parallel. The humanitarian response and the effective development and uh, uh, rehabilitating and educating the, low, the, the, the refugees to take them into the developmental stage in a safe area where there is area where there is no conflict. Once you enable them, they will be able to become professional and build the economy of the local community based on the market economy, the local market economy, who can build the society. So from the outcry to building economy and society. So the outcry will create the society and build the community that we want to establish in this area. Can I have the second one, please? How we do this? How we do this? If you have 100 pounds, 
or you have a million do pound or dollar or whatever you call it, traditional he spend only 65% at the time of the first day of the conflict on humanitarian traditional response. What is, the, what is traditional humanitarian response is? It is food delivery, water, shelter, clothes, and medicine. Okay? Only 65% to enable you to, when you do humanitarian response, you build the society and develop the community. 15% on selective humanitarian response. What do I mean by selective or specialized humanitarian response? This 15% is for training, capacity building of the local community as individuals, as local government, as local organizations, and in the, uh, uh, as a whole. So we have to spend this 15% on developing those human resources. This will safeguard the, the delivery of the 65%. Because if we don't have trained staff, professional staff from the community, we can waste the 65%. Why I am calling it selective humanitarian response? Because the donor, the traditional donor that we have, even the big donors, the international donors, do not spend this amount of money from day one. They want everything to be food and water and shelter. Fine, that's good. But food and water and shelter in an untrained, non-professional hands, it will be wasting the 65% and might not create those people whom from the very beginning will be able to rebuild huh? and strengthen, the, to rebuild their own society and strengthen the social fabric on the society. Media and advocacy, 10%. No way that we are going to get in, in these two. Why? Because you have to have your media and advocacy machine to keep people aware of what's happening to the refugees, to the children, to the women, to the displaced, to the orphans, to the sick, to the elderly, there. And the traditional donor must be educated by you. It's our failure of not telling those traditional donors, please, Give us 10% to do this and to maintain huh, the spirit of the issue, of the problem in the hearts of the people. So they can respond to us. So this 10%. Okay? The last 10%, what I call it, strategic reserve or development. We must think ahead from day one on what will happen to us when there's a ceasefire. You know what will happen to us when there's a ceasefire? There's no fun. Media is out. Syria problem is not going to be number one, to be number 10. Because other problems will come up. Yemen problem is not going to be number one, to be number 10. Because there will be another problem. Iraq problem, South Sudan problem, the DRC problem, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So we have to create this strategic fund to keep it for us. It is not waqf, by the way. It's a strategic fund to be used soon, huh? soon to have a ceasefire. Or, the second alternative is that this 10% from the very beginning, we can use it in an area, in the area, and if, if you talk about the, the country like Syria, and there's a conflict in one zone, but there's safety in another zone. So with this 10%, we can do some developmental program with the 10%, in another area to enable the community to stay and to enable other communities to move to such a safe area and to enable the community to look to create their local leadership who will be able to train the local community in the conflict zone so i've got two choices here from the, this is from the very beginning don't come and tell me i'm doing development program after the ceasefire i said you are wrong you have to find a way 
of starting this developmental program or projects in a safer area in the country of conflict to build social fabric of society, to build the community, to build the stability, and actually to move some of the displaced people into these safer zones instead of going out to the neighbor, neighboring countries. So 65%, 15%, 65% traditional media response, 15% selective media response, 10% advocacy and media, and I can assure you that most of our organizations, so-called Muslim or Arab organizations, don't have department for advocacy, and most of us don't have strategic reserve from the fund that we raise because we spend every penny, huh, every day, till the zero account. Here, each fund, each part of this budget should be given independently to the department responsible. There's a department dealing with traditional response, department dealing with him, uh, a selective response, department dealing with media advocacy, and department dealing with strategic fund and development. Don't give all the money to the one in charge of this traditional response because they will eat the other ones. Okay, distinction. Huh? Separation of responsibility. That's the second one. Next one. What, how we'll spend the money or the budget after we'll post armor conflict, after the conflict? Of course, the equation will be different. Be 30% for construction, 30% for the developmental program which we have started earlier, the still the 15% of the selective humanitarian response stays as it is, and the 10% of advocacy and media stays as it is, untouchable. Okay? And the strategic reserve will go from 10% to 5%. This is for any contingency operation. The strategy comes here. Advocacy and media, 10% stays as it is. Selective humanitarian response, which is uh, uh, training, capacity building, and strengthening the social public, 15%. And the 5% is strategic air reserve. We can still maintain 10% to give people traditional humanitarian response, because people, after the ceasefire, will still need some humanitarian traditional response such as water, medicine, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. This is during the conflict, and this is during after conflict. So what I'm saying, don't wait till there's a ceasefire to start the process of development. The good example of Syria case now, Aleppo. Two years ago, some parts of Aleppo were exporting uh, products to Turkey. And some people started to bring money back to the safe Aleppo to invest the money inside it during the conflict. It was a conflict, three years, four years of conflict in different parts of Syria, but Aleppo and the other small town were producing. So do not undermine and underestimate the, 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 the capability and the ability and the power of the local community of being able to be productive at the time of war. Respect them, keep their dignity, protect their dignity, and empower them, and they will be our partner during and after the conflict, and with them, we can develop, we can start developmental projects at the time of conflict in a safer zone. So to conclude is, can you bring the first slide, two slides please. No, not this one. No. Here, humanitarian response, which we call it relief, is not something haphazardly done by anybody. Wrong. It's a profession. It's not a program that a donor wake up at night or have a dream and say, okay, I want you to do this. We have seen a lot of ugly programs and projects have been done in Syria conflict 
because of the wish of uneducated, so to say ignorant donor who wish to implement his or her dream and the local organization will actually force it to accept it because they want some fund to come to the organization. Wrong. It is an operational professional program. Not a luck, not a jump, not something like a dream from some donor who no, does not know where is Syria, the mechanics, the social fabric, the culture, and the value, and the uh, uh, manner of those people. And from the very beginning, we should believe strongly that humanitarian response is society development. From the very beginning and from day one, we should be encouraged to develop the area where there is no conflict in it. And we will invest the 10%, the golden 10% into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.